This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the Paradoxical Eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I have been a professor of medicine and a clinical cardiologist at UCLA for about 25 years. But about 12 years ago, I got a telephone call that changed my life. And that call came from one of the veterinarians at the Los Angeles Zoo. And he called me because one of their chimpanzees had woken up with a facial droop. They were concerned that she might have had a stroke and he asked if I'd come to the zoo and image her heart to look for blood clots and other things that might have been the problem. And this is the hospital at the zoo that I went to. And um, this is actually me with my first non-human animal, and I'm gonna come back to her in just a moment. But a few weeks after I visited with this chimpanzee, I was asked to rule out a torn aorta in a gorilla. And not long after that, there was a California condor that they noted a heart murmur in, and they asked if I would look to see whether one of the valves was torn, which in fact it was. There was a California sea lion whose lower body had filled with fluid, and they were concerned about congestive heart failure and asked if I'd come. And in this picture, I'm listening to the heart of a lion uh, who had had a collection of over 700 cc's of fluid in the sac in which her heart is contained. And in a collaborative procedure involving veterinarians and human cardiologists, we drained the fluid from her heart. And this, by the way, is a procedure that I have done on hundreds of human patients. But I must say that the procedure itself was um, identical to the procedure that I've done uh, on humans with the exception of this. And where is it? There we go, and that. Let's get back to my first patient, this chimpanzee who had had the, the suspected stroke. I remember when I first put the probe uh, into her mouth and slid it down the esophagus, I turned to the screen and this is what I saw. A four-chambered beating heart, a left ventricle, a right ventricle, two atria, but I noticed that there were blood clots moving, these round, bouncing balls, and that the upper chambers were enlarged. And as soon as I saw that picture, it reminded me of a human patient I had imaged at UCLA some weeks before, who had the enlarged atria and the blood clots. And I realized that these two patients, one human and one chimpanzee, had spontaneously developed the same kind of infiltrative heart failure that I had been treating for years with high technology and advanced pharmaceuticals. And I found myself being a little bit surprised 
But then I was more curious about why I was surprised. I mean, I certainly knew that we shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees between five and seven million years ago, which of course is a blink in the scope of evolutionary time. And as an undergraduate, I had worked for four years in a museum of comparative zoology. But when I had gone to medical school, and like most medical students today, what I had learned the connection between animal and human health was, was infectious, pathogenic, zoonotic. And of course, there is no question that animals play an important role in the transmission of diseases that have a high impact on human communities. Even more so now, the One Health community is helping us realize that the majority of infections that will impact human populations are coming from animal reservoirs. But what I didn't learn, and most medical students don't, is that the father of modern medicine, Sir William Osler, is also considered the father of modern veterinary medicine. And that one of his teachers, the father of modern pathology, Rudolf Virchow wrote in the 19th century, between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line, nor should there be. The object is different, but the experience obtained constitutes the basis of all medicine. But what I was finding was that while I was taking care of my human patients at UCLA, I would go to the zoo, and I would hear the veterinarians discuss the management of metastatic breast cancer, or the, the management of brittle diabetes, or the dosage of serotonin reuptake inhibitor drugs like Prozac for some of their patients who are anxious or compulsive. And I realized that as much as I knew about human medicine, I knew so little about veterinary medicine. And it turns out there has been a gulf between these two fields. Now, there are many reasons for that. Some are historical, some are cultural, but I'm gonna focus on two for a moment. The first, I believe, has to do with our essential ambivalence about embracing our own animal natures. But the other is human exceptionalism. We all are scientists, many of us are scientists here, and we theoretically accept that human beings are merely one species in a spectrum of other species. Not uniquely unique, but unique like all others. Love this. And we can zone in and see, here we are. And yet, and yet, even the most scientifically minded of us may um, harbor some residual human exceptionalism. In fact, I believe there is a medical expression of human exceptionalism which is contributing to this gulf between the fields. And I became curious. What is the extent of the overlap in the pathology of humans and animals? And so I asked, do non-human animals develop heart attacks or heart failure, type 1, type 2 diabetes, brain tumors, concussions, strokes, asthma, allergies, breast cancer, leukemia, infertility, painful periods, sexual dysfunction? And of course, the answer to every one of those questions is yes. Now, of course, our bad human habits amplify the risk of disease. It is the basis of preventative medicine, and I have spent 25 years encouraging improved diets and more action, activity. And yet, although our bad human habits may increase the risk of disease, the essential vulnerability to disease is ancient. Let's quickly talk about two big killers, breast cancer and heart disease. We know that breast cancer has a high human impact on the human community. It's the leading um, cause of, of cancer among women. But breast cancer is not unique to humans. In fact, um, many of you who have cats may know that cats are at risk. Dogs can be as well. This is a mastectomy scar from a cat whose owner um, felt a, a mass when she was petting her. And in fact, breast cancer has been found in mammals uh, of almost every um, variety from polar bears to elephants to marsupials, llamas, marine mammals, beluga whales. In fact, notably, there seems to be a particularly high rate of breast cancer among some big cats. And we can talk about that at another time, why that might be. But it's notable, one fascinating connection is that the reason that some jaguars have a particularly elevated rate of breast cancer is probably related to a mutation of the BRCA1 gene. 
And it is the same mutation that makes some human females at elevated risk for breast cancer. Now, of course, there are regions of the world where practices, habits, genetics, diets um, are different, and the rates of breast cancer are lower. But that merely underscores the fact that while our bad human habits may increase the risk of our disease, the essential vulnerability to disease is ancient. The age of mammals started about 200 million years ago, and I suspect that the vulnerability, therefore, to breast cancer can be stated, in a sense, to be as old as that. What about heart attacks? So cardiovascular disease, it is the number one cause of death globally in the United States. Those statistics um, are amplified. And we know that most heart attacks are caused by the progressive buildup of atherosclerosis in the arteries, that eventually that atherosclerosis breaks, there is a blood clot that ceases the flow of blood through the artery, and the muscle downstream dies. And in this section of an artery, you see the atherosclerosis, the plaque. It has fractured. There is a blood clot, and this individual died of a stroke. But this individual was not a human. What we see here is an, Himalayan, uh, an Egyptian vulture, rather, fl uh, flying on the base of the Himalayans. And it turns out that if you look at a phylogeny um, of atherosclerosis across avian species, every place that there is a star, there's at least one species within this order in whom atherosclerosis and stroke, heart attack, and other clinical syndromes have been seen. Now, of course, our bad human habits amplify the risk of disease. I've spent my life as a clinician helping patients modify their lifestyles. We know that. We know that bad human habits do contribute to heart disease. But recognizing that atherosclerosis and heart attacks and strokes have been identified in animals as varied as walruses, dolphins, camels, and of course, humans suggest that while bad human habits may amplify the risk of disease, the essential vulnerability is ancient. And again, the timeline pointing to atherosclerosis. And if this is true of the somatic diseases like heart attack and uh, breast cancer, it is also true for mental illnesses. There is a hair plucking syndrome seen here in this picture where people pluck out the hair of their eyelashes, um, of their, any part of their body. But it is remarkable that this bears a similarity to a hair plucking and feather plucking syndrome that is seen in some bird species. You can see that this parrot has plucked, denuded um, his thorax. And it is notable that the compulsive tail chasing seen in bull terriers treatable with Prozac or the flank sucking, the compulsive flank sucking seen in Dobermans, treatable with Prozac, bears similar similarities to the compulsive behaviors we see in some humans with obsessive compulsive disorder. And it is notable that like some human beings with anorexia nervosa, some non-human animals respond to social stress by starving themselves, sometimes to death, while others deal with stress by causing themselves to regurgitate. Our bad human habits may increase our risk of disease, but the essential vulnerability to disease is ancient. Why is this important? There are scientific and medical advances that can come of thinking comparatively, looking across species. Translational medicine traditionally means taking research that is being done at the bench in the laboratory and bringing it to the bedside. But I would suggest that there is another way of working translationally, and that is by looking across species and across time for connections that generate novel hypotheses that can ultimately be translated into science that can save lives. Furthermore, I believe these insights have the potential to reduce stigma and increase compassion for people suffering from physical illness and mental illness. I would like to end by modifying the words of the late, great Susan Sontag to reflect the species-spanning nature of health and disease 
and the deep and ancient connection we all share, not just with other human beings, but with all of the patients on the planet. She wrote, illness is the night side of life, more onerous citizenship. Everyone and everything who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. And although we all prefer to use the good passport, sooner or later, each of us is obliged to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. Thank you for your attention. I think I'll start off with a evolutionarily very strange photo. This is Heidi Klum, the supermodel with her four children. And this is an almost unique sort of photo in the mammalian kingdom. And why, why is it unique? You won't see a chimpanzee mother with four children under her care at any one time. A chimpanzee mother raises her offspring to independence before she has the next child. Um, same with gorillas, with orangutans, and pretty well most of all other um, primates. A mother can only have another child once the previous child is independent. But here is Heidi, and she's got four children, all of different ages, and all of them dependent for their well-being on parental care, maternal care. Now, raising four children at a time is hard work, and there's an interesting evolutionary question how human mothers are able to um, do this. But it creates um, sorts of interactions among siblings that you don't find elsewhere. I should point out that there are, of course, other mammals that produce multiple offspring at the same time. They produce a litter, but in those cases, all of those offspring are the same age. Now, the, the existence of multiple children, all dependent for at the same time for maternal care means that they tend to compete amongst each other for maternal care and attention. And when I look at photos like this, I always like to look, where are the hands? And so if you look at this picture, um, here is um, Heidi's right hand is holding her youngest child. Her other hand is holding the hand of her eldest daughter here. And she is sufficiently rich that she can afford another pair of hands to look after her two other children. So here's one of the hands holding this child, and then the second hand of the helper is sort of hidden behind her um, body. So raising children is hard work. Raising a child is not cost-free, and sometimes people challenge me about that, you know. But think about it. If raising children weren't costly, a natural selection acts to maximize lifetime reproductive success. If there were no cost of child raising, mothers would have evolved to produce an infinite number of offspring, which they clearly don't do. Offspring compete for maternal care and attention. That's if you're using your right hand to hold one child, you don't have the right hand available to grab another child when it's getting into um, danger. Now, there's another interesting thing about that um, photo. And this is that, um, as is well known, um, Heidi's eldest daughter has a different father from her other three children. And this genetically creates an interesting asymmetry. So all of these four children are related to each other maternally. Um, if you picked a gene in Heidi, it's got a one chance in two of being present in each of her offspring. These are all maternal half-sibs. So they're all related maternally, but the paternal genes of this child are necessarily absent from the three siblings there. So this child is unrelated for her paternal genome to Heidi's other three children. And this leaves evolutionarily to a conflict within the genomes of children over the extraction of um, care from mothers, which ultimately translates as costs of 
their care having impacts on their siblings who might be maternal half-sibs. So maternal and paternal genes of a child disagree over the value of half-siblings who share one parent but not both parents. And so here's the sort of uh, graph that you've seen before in earlier talks. I put fetus here, but I'm just referring to a child here. We're looking at effects on fitness of the child and effects on fitness of its siblings. And just dividing this space, there are some sorts of outcomes, some things that can happen that are of benefit to the child and to its siblings. There are some things that are of cost to a child and to its siblings. And then there is the zone of trade-offs where some action is benefiting one child at the cost to other children. That's the holding of one child in your hand, meaning that that hand is not available to look after other children. So these are the zones of a trade-off in parental care. And so just looking at what natural selection maximizes in this situation, so first of all I'm going to look at natural selection acting on genes of maternal origin in a child with respect to costs on maternal half-siblings, the offspring of other fathers. And so natural selection is predicted to maximize this sum here, this is the benefit to the child and this is the cost to the fitness of its um, siblings. The child values itself evolutionarily at twice the value of siblings because a gene in the child is definitely present in that child but has only got a 50% chance, this is a maternal gene, of being present in siblings. So natural selection will favor a behavior when this sum is positive which is in this region of the phase space, what is called matrilineal inclusive fitness is increased. But for paternally derived genes in a, in a maternal half-sib, what's relevant is the effect on the fitness of the child itself because it is unrelated to its siblings. So as long as the benefit to the child is positive, natural selection will favor increasing demands on the mothers. So combining those two situations, we have regions where there is an absence of evolutionary conflict between genes of maternal and paternal origin. This is where they both benefit. This is where they both suffer a cost and natural selection would act against genes with these sort of effects. But then we have a zone of trade-off of conflict within the genome where genes of maternal origin would benefit by the mother allocating more resources to siblings, whereas genes of paternal origin would benefit from the child receiving more maternal care itself. This is where the cost-benefit ratio is sitting in between a half and zero. This is the zone of intragenomic conflict. And for the second half of the talk, I'm just going to look at some human genetic disorders where genes so-called imprinted genes have an effect and these provide clues about the action of this evolutionary conflict during human evolution. Now an imprinted gene is a gene that is expressed differently whether you get it from your mother or from your um, father. It has an imprint, a record of its past history, what sex of body it was in in the previous generation, and that affects what it does in the current generation. So paternally derived genes in offspring are predicted to favor greater demands on mothers than will maternally derived genes in offspring. And so here we will look at an example of a chromosome region on human chromosome 11 where there are some imprinted genes. Let's focus here this is a gene called IGF2 for insulin-like growth factor 2. Here we're looking at the chromosome a child gets from its mother. And on this chromosome, I've got a red dot there. The IGF2 gene is not being expressed, whereas on the copy that the child gets from its father, the IGF2 gene is being expressed. IGF2 is a fetal growth enhancer. 
This is a gene that is promoting growth of the placenta and is increasing birth weight. And it's not being expressed when it comes from the mother, but being expressed when it comes from the father. Now, this is called imprinting because this isn't anything to do with the DNA sequence itself. In my body, the copy of IGF-2 I got from my mother is silent, but if I pass that silent copy on to my children, it's going to be active in my children because they got it from their father. In this chromosome region, there is a second gene with the opposite pattern of imprinting, CDKN1C. This is a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor. This is an inhibitor of progression through the cell cycle. So this is stopping cells dividing and growing larger. So this is an inhibitor of growth, and it shows the opposite pattern of imprinting. It's expressed off the maternal chromosome, so the gene coming from the mother is acting to reduce growth, whereas the gene copy coming from the father is silent. So in essence, we have a situation where simultaneously during fetal development, we have a paternal foot on the accelerator of growth here, of IGF-2 being expressed from the paternal chromosome, promoting growth. The maternal foot is off the accelerator, but the maternal foot is on the brake, reducing growth, and the paternal foot in the child, in the same cells, is not applied to that brake, and normal fetal development is determined by the balance of paternal acceleration and maternal breaking. And so this internal conflict can be re revealed in rare genetic disorders where parts of this process go wrong. So I'll start off with, I'll look at beckwith Biedemann syndrome. This is a fetal overgrowth syndrome, so these children are born rather large. I have a friend who had beckwith Biedemann syndrome as a child, and she's given me her baby photo to look at. Um, so here she is. She was about 13 pounds at birth. Um, typical of beckwith Biedemann syndrome, she has macroglossia, which is just what medical people use to say. It's Latin for having a large tongue. I suspect evolutionarily this is the tongue muscle is the pump during breastfeeding, and so paternal genes are particularly involved in promoting the development of the tongue muscles. Now, what are the causes of this fetal overgrowth syndrome? In a number of cases, um, individuals turn out to have two paternal copies of this chromosome region. This is called paternal uniparental disomy. So in this case, they have two copies of IGF-2. They have two paternal feet on the accelerator and no maternal feet on the brake. So they have fetal overgrowth. It's also associated with a high risk of a number of childhood cancers. Some other people with the same diagnosis of beckwith Wiedemann syndrome of fetal overgrowth have a mutation, an inactivating mutation, in the maternal copy of CDKN1C. So this is the break on fetal growth. So the maternal copy, which is normally expressed, is inactivated by a mutation. The paternal copy is inactivated as normally occurs. And so in this case, they've got a paternal foot on the accelerator of growth and no maternal foot on the brake. And this is associated with fetal overgrowth and a similar, similar clinical diagnosis, though apparently not with the increased risk of childhood cancers. Such a condition is interesting. If, um, if a male who had this mutation and had beckwith Biedemann syndrome passed the mutant gene on to his children, they would have normal development because they would get a normal gene from their mother and the mutant gene that is coming from the affected male um, would have been inactivated anyway. So this is a case where a mutation is having an effect when inherited from a parent of one sex but not from a parent of the other. Silver-Russell syndrome is a intrauterine growth retardation syndrome. And so here I have a picture of two girls of the same age. This little girl here has Silver-Russell syndrome. It's associated with very low birth weights, 
not associated with catch-up growth, so if not treated, these individuals grow up to be very small adults. It's also associated with severe feeding difficulties as an infant. Some individuals with Silver Russell syndrome have two maternal copies of this chromosome region, so now they have no paternal foot on the accelerator of growth and two maternal feet on the brake associated with intrauterine growth retardation and small birth weight. Other individuals have a loss of DNA methylation at what is called the imprinting control region one here. This leads to the inactivation of the paternal copy of IGF-2, so now they have no foot on the accelerator of growth and that's associated with intrauterine growth retardation. For the final part of the talk, I want to talk about a different pair of syndromes that are associated with a different cluster of imprinted genes. These reside on human chromosome 15, and here the imprinting is specific to the brain and doesn't occur in most other um, tissues. I won't go into the details of naming these genes, just to point out that there are some genes, like this one here, that are not expressed on the maternal chromosome, but are expressed on the paternal chromosome, and other genes with the opposite pattern of expression expressed on the maternal chromosome, but not on the paternal chromosome. Some interesting things in this region. Here is where the single nucleotide polymorphism that in European populations makes the difference between blue and brown eyes resides. And sitting here, a gene that I won't talk about, this gene, Macorin 3, so this is a gene that is only expressed when you get from your father, but not expressed from the mother. When children have a mutation in this paternally derived gene copy, recent work from Brazil said they have precocious puberty, that they go through puberty usually before age of 10 years. So this is suggesting that a paternally expressed gene on this chromosome is inhibiting pubertal progression, which raises some interesting evolutionary questions. Okay, so here is a young child with Prader-Willi syndrome. I'm going to focus on the childhood um, symptoms of Prader-Willi syndrome. These children, some of you might know, in studying in their second to third year of life, they go from being anorexic, of having no appetite, to becoming hyperphagic, and they become massively obese. But I'm just going to be focusing on the symptoms that these children have in the immediate perinatal period. So this girl is showing the hypotonia of Prader-Willi syndrome. Most individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome have a deletion of the paternal copy of this chromosome. So they've only got maternally expressed genes coming from this region and no paternal copy. A few other people have two maternal copies of this region and they have Prader-Willi syndrome. So what this is showing is that Prader-Willi syndrome is caused by the absence of expression of genes that come from the father. Interestingly, in individuals with maternal uniparental disomy, this is one of the most penetrant causes of psychosis. Um, sitting down in this region of the region, this is a GABA receptor cluster, and there appears to be some sort of parent of origin effect occurring here that is predisposing these individuals to developing psychosis. So Prader-Willi syndrome is associated with the absence of expression of paternally derived genes, and therefore evolutionary, this leads to a prediction that Prader-Willi syndrome should exhibit an exaggeration of traits that reduce demands on mother. So this region contains paternal accelerators on offspring demands on mothers. We're taking away those paternal genes, and so you should see in the child reduced demands on the mother. So let's look at the neonatal phenotype in Prader-Willi syndrome. It's associated with low muscle tension, neonatal hypertonia, with a weak cry. These are low maintenance children, and with poor suck. So these children have little to no interest in feeding, and they have very weak or non-existing suckling reflexes. Usually they have to have a tube put into the stomach, gavage feeding, to give them adequate nutrition. They show excessive sleepiness. 
Um, the child is put to bed and it stays asleep. So this suggests that paternal genes that are absent in Prader-Willi syndrome promote suckling and they also promote wakefulness. So in their absence you have a child that doesn't suckle and a child that sleeps through the night. And I have suggested that evolutionarily paternal genes are promoting more intense suckling and also night waking in children, in, in babies, as a way of essentially exhausting mothers and delaying her return to fertility, delaying the conception of a younger sibling who will compete for maternal um, care and attention. Interestingly, deletions of precisely the same chromosome region cause a completely different syndrome. This is a boy with Angelman syndrome. The majority of cases, 70% of cases of Angelman syndrome have a deletion of the same chromosome region, but in this case it's a deletion of the maternal chromosome, so they only have a paternal copy of this region. So now we would expect an exaggeration of um, behaviours that increase costs to, to mothers. We know of a couple of cases of women with Prader-Willi syndrome who had a deletion of their paternal chromosome that were fertile and had a child and passed the deletion on to their children. Their child got it from their mother, so the child of a Prader-Willi syndrome woman has Angelman syndrome. Some other individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome have been activating mutations in this gene here, UBE3A, which is normally expressed only on the maternal chromosome. So now the maternal copy is inactivated by mutation and the paternal copy is inactivated by genomic imprinting. And this suggests that Angerman syndrome, most of the symptoms are caused by the absence of expression of the maternally derived copy of this gene, UBE3A. So Angerman syndrome is predicted to exaggerate traits that increase offspring demands on mothers. And I'll just look at some of the um, symptoms of Angerman syndrome. So Angerman syndrome is associated with uncoordinated suck and swallow, but these children do not need to be gavage fed. It's as if there's hyperactivity in the suckling reflex. They get adequate nutrition so they don't show failure to thrive. They have adequate nutrition, as I've mentioned. They are hypertonic rather than hypotonic. They have ataxia, hyperactivity. Particularly tiring for parents, they have excessive wakefulness as babies. I know of clinical reports of babies who were awake 21 hours out of 24. Parents are advised to get some sleep, sometimes to put the child in a darkened room and close the door. Angerman syndrome is associated with happy affect. The laughing, smiling child you saw in the previous picture, this is particular in interactions with potential caregivers, and it's associated with frequent laughter. These are happy, smiling children. Curiously, um, this is associated with a complete absence of the development of speech or even of sign language. So these children have um, have some degree of cognitive delay, but the absence of speech seems to be out of proportion to the cognitive problems. It seems to be a specific deficit in this imprinted disorder. The suggestion is that children with Angerman syndrome exhibit exaggerated attachment behaviours that normally engage maternal attention and elicit maternal care. This is the laughing, smiling baby that the mother wants to put attention, give attention to. And I'll finish with another photo and just look at the hands in the photo. So here we have mum holding on to the hands of two children and this child misses out and doesn't get a maternal hand. Thank you. When we talk about medicine, I think it's quite important to think about what, what is medicine. Right? It is the study and intervention of human physiological systems and physical systems and psychiatric systems when they are dysregulated to attempt to correct what is going on to improve human health. 
And in order to do that, we have to have a deep understanding of not only the dysfunction of these systems, but how they function when, when doing healthy things within our bodies. And so, to me, the term medicine really means applied human biology. And as every biologist knows, we have a favorite quote, which is that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And this means that to understand the organizing principles of any organism biologically on this planet, we need to understand its evolutionary history and the series of selective pressures that have shaped that organism to function the way it does in the particular context in which it finds itself. And as an anthropologist who studies maternal health and infant development, I have a particularly favorite adaptation that I care about. And it is the synthesis of milk from mammary glands, which is the defining characteristic of our mammalian class. It's, it's as Barbara pointed out, why mammals are at risk of breast cancer, because we have mammary glands. And mother's milk, initially, a random mutation for a minor secretion that perhaps hydrated young or provided rudimentary immunofactors has been shaped by hundreds of millions of years of evolution and natural selection to become increasingly complex, such that it provides nourishment for young, it provides a comprehensive immune protection for the pathogens babies are likely to encounter, and it also provides bioactive hormones from maternal circulation that cross over into the infant and influence infant physiological regulation. It is due to this complex biofluid that is food, medicine, and signal that has led every major governmental and non-governmental organization to recognize mother's milk as both liquid gold and breastfeeding as the gold standard of early life input from the mother. However, because of the ubiquity of milk within our environment and its seeming replication in the form of artificial breast milks that you can buy at the store, we have come to take milk for granted and think of it as a standardized, systematized, simple kind of thing. And we've lost sight of the things that make it incredibly complex and special. And it's that we have not actually identified what are liquid gold standards. We do not have a systematic understanding of milk, how it varies, what that variance does when ingested by the infant. And these are fundamental things that we need to un uncover in order to better manage infant health within the neonatal intensive care unit and better target our public health intervention. And so, I think an evolutionary perspective is incredibly important in order to both design and, and, and effectively target research studies, but also to help inform our understanding of this dynamic system. Because lactation is a complex adaptive system in which natural selection has shaped mother's physiology and their mammary glands to synthesize milk in complex ways. And there's a fundamental thing that I think is very challenging when we're, when we're thinking about managing the health of a mother and an infant. Because we think about how do we optimize that infant's outcome in that particular time and place for the challenges that infant is handling or trying to handle. And this is challenging because natural selection has not shaped mothers to optimize the outcome of a particular infant. Natural selection has shaped mother's physiology to allocate investment in young across an entire reproductive career to maximize her reproductive success across her reproductive lifespan. Okay. And because of this, we see that there are going to be a number of trade-offs in how she allocates resources between her own body and how she's nourishing her infant. Right. Just like I can only spend a dollar once, an organism can only burn a calorie once. And if that calorie is burned on immune function, it's not available to allocate toward infant development. And we see the signature of these trade-offs broadly in how mothers are synthesizing milk. But this evolutionary life history perspective has not been systematically integrated into medical approaches within infant care management. The important thing there is that this food, medicine, and signal of milk is going to vary across all mothers. The presence and abundance of particular milk bioactives is not standardized. And in fact, the signature in milk across each individual mother is going to be different. When we look at milk synthesis across every single potential 
scale of consideration, we find that milk varies. It varies across species, it varies across populations within species, across individuals within population, within individual across lactations, within individual within a lactation, and we can actually see the synthesis of milk and the composition of particular bioactives shift from hour to hour throughout the day. And so to, to kind of think about what are the, the signatures that we see in the milk a mother synthesizes. So uh, Dr. Elizabeth Quinn has shown that just the fat content in milk, right, you can go to the store and it's processed and you can get it at 3%, 2%, 1%, or where the fat's entirely removed. But across human populations, the mean value of the fat content in their milk is substantially variable. We see gradients between rural and urban communities in things like their minerals, fatty acids, hormones, and, and, and sugars within milk. We see the signature of cultural ecology in the form of subsistence patterns in their milk. Uh, this has been shown for fatty acids, immunofactors, sugars, and minerals. Melanie Martin, now at Yale University, has shown that among forager horticulturalists in the Amazon, that the omega-3 fatty acid concentration in their milk is not only higher than that which is found in the breast milk of women living in the Ohio River Valley, but their ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s is closer to what we consider to be most healthy for infants. Across individuals, when we look at dairy cows as a, as a model for lactation biology, humans and monkeys as another model for human biomedicine, we find that maternal characteristics are going to leave their signature in milk. Mothers who have better body condition, lower parasite loads, and, and greater social capital or access to resources are going to synthesize milk in different ways than mothers who are more constrained. We see this in the volume of milk that they're producing, the fat concentration, and hormonal signals. Similarly, across these same species, we find that the infant's characteristics are also implicated in the variation of milk that mothers are synthesizing. So the age of the infant at birth in terms of gestational age, the infant's sex, whether it's male or female, and whether or not the infant is sick are all implicated in different aspects of milk composition and, and production. This differentiated biological recipe in milk has been found broadly across a number of different mammal species. And it's important to understand that this does not necessarily mean that mothers are making better or worse milk for either sons or daughters. But where sons and daughters have different developmental priorities, different developmental trajectories, we can expect that the milk that mothers use to nourish them is going to influence aspects of those developmental trajectories. When we go to the grocery store or the pharmacy, there's different deodorant for men and women, right? But when we go into the infant formula section in the grocery store, it's one size fits all. And we do not yet have enough information scientifically to say that that's not best practices. We haven't allocated the research effort to understanding could we get better infant developmental outcomes if we had more tailored milk for them, for infants who don't have access to breast milk for whatever reason. Across time, we see that mothers early in their reproductive career, dairy cows, seals, and, and monkeys I work with, that adolescent mothers make different milk than mature mothers, that across parodies, mothers make different milks. This can be in the nutritional components as well as the hormonal components of their milk, and the signatures that this may leave in infant development are still poorly understood. So lactation is an adaptive contingency system in which mothers that have access to more resources are able to upregulate aspects of milk synthesis, or mothers that are constrained downregulate milk synthesis to protect their condition for future reproduction. And this is shown both through the milk that they're synthesizing and their behavioral dynamic with their infant. And this is a function of maternal resources and their allocations among different trade-off priorities. Right? An adolescent 13-year-old human mother is going to be constrained in her capacity to synthesize milk. So that means that clinical support for that mother-infant dyad is going to have to take into consideration the, the cascading trade-off allocations between her condition and the condition of her infant. And this is important because where milk production is constrained, where milk production is insufficient, we see impacts on infant development. So milk composition and milk volume is implicated in infant growth, 
their immune function, how microbes colonize their intestinal tract, their cognition, and their behavior. You see this in animal model systems in a variety of different human settings. And this is quite important because in the, in the media, we're seeing a lot of pushback on the specialness of breast milk or the importance of breast milk because it's really centered around a narrative of best case scenario. For full term infants that are born healthy and raised in incredibly protected and buffered environments, the effect size that's transferred by being breastfed or formula fed is going to be fairly moderate. But when we anchor the narrative to those best case scenarios, we lose sight of many situations in which the consequences can be quite a bit dire. So if we think about the premature infant born in the less than 39 weeks that ends up in the, uh, you know, the very, very young infants, 25, 27, 29 weeks of age that spend a substantial amount of time in the neonatal intensive care unit, breast milk or bioactive features of breast milk can be absolutely critical for their health. If we think of children growing up in spaces with uh, substantial infectious disease risk, then the immunofactors that are present in breast milk and not found in other alternatives are going to be very important. In settings in which there's a substantial risk of development of allergies or other kinds of autoimmune kinds of challenges, then breast milk may be a buffer to that. And even when we think about that best case scenario where individuals are most buffered and the effect sizes are most moderate, when we scale those up across a population, the health consequences add up and the healthcare dollar costs add up substantially. So we need to think about not just best case scenarios, not just one shot interactions, but at, at public health population levels as well. So this is a complex adaptive system and we can use that understanding of these systems and how they've been shaped by natural selection to identify particular strategies and targets for interventions. So some aspects of milk synthesis are gonna be quite flexible, some are going to represent constraints, and some are going to be fixed as a function of genotype or other kinds of variables. In these situations where these represent trade-offs of the mother, we can use public interventions, access to resources, social justice and public health interventions like the WIC program to help improve the resources so mothers are not trading off to the same extent as they are when they have fewer resources. When the constraints become more fixed, when there isn't a capacity to influence mothers to upregulate their milk synthesis or shift their milk composition, then we have opportunities in which evolutionary insights can yield important uh, advances to how we approach milk management. Okay? So right now we see that 20 million infants are born premature across the globe each year. Uh, the vast majority of these are happening in the global south. And these infants are administered milk as a clinical intervention. So this is either donor milk, formula, or other kinds of commodified milk products which have their own bioethical considerations. Right now, these milks represent mean values as though they, we know the gold standard. And this is a erasing of a lot of the individual or more specialized tailored features of the milk. And these products and interventions are based off of mean values among what we would call, or what Joe Henrik would coin, weird populations. Westernized, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic populations, okay? Weird, they're weird. And they do not necessarily reflect ancestral conditions or the uh, diversity of milks that mothers are making. Right? But if we make this our gold standard, and it's not actually the best target for us to replicate or match, then, then we're going down a suboptimal pathway. So we can think about what do we know about milk? What, what has already been found out? And can we from there design clinical trials and other kinds of studies to see if there's added value space within clinical care? So right now in the NICU, some form of milk is being provided. Can we do better if we start thinking in terms of precision milk along with other aspects of precision medicine? So can we do better if we match milk for the, whether the child or the baby is a son or a daughter? Can we do better if we give morning milk in the morning and night milk at night? Right. 
Adults and children have a circadian rhythm in which our glucocorticoids are higher in the morning and lower in the afternoon, in the evening, and while we sleep. Right? Babies don't have a circadian rhythm. They get information about a circadian rhythm through their mother's milk. So what happens when we provide day milk at night? Does that excite the baby systems? This is an empirical question for which we do not have published information at this time. For babies that get milk, um, could we do better if we match donors in a selective way? Right? That we add value by picking milk from particular life history stages or mothers of particular genotype in the donor, donor options. Right? It's an empirical question we don't yet know. The FUT2 genotype influences what sugars um, and whether or not they're fucosylated are present in milk, and these are important for influencing the microbial colonizations of the infant's gut. Can we target pooling milk across mothers to create a super milk that's going to be quite important for particularly vulnerable or sick infants? Can we mix glycans to maximize uh, the health of the microbial systems colonizing the infant's gut? Can we provide particular microbes to those infants? Uh, right now, all of the milk processing um, techniques in the neonatal intensive care unit involve neutralizing these components of, of milk that we know are potentially uh, quite important. And lastly, can we co-opt and bioengineer milk bioactives from other species that are solving evolutionary problems that have importance for infants in the NICU today? So when you look at the marsupials, kangaroos, wallabies, they're born at very, very early stages of development. Right? They, they have very undeveloped lungs. And there's milk bioactives within the milk that their mothers synthesize that accelerate the development of their lungs specifically. Could it be possible to, to, to replicate or bioengineer that in ways that we can provide it to these 25, 27, 29 week old infants who are at huge risk for pneumonia disease because their lungs are undeveloped? And there are people in Australia working on answering that question right now. They're using an evolutionary perspective of how natural selection has shaped adaptations to solve problems that have implications for the unique challenges that humans face in our, in our particular cultural context. And lastly, when most of this has been talking about donor milks and bioengineering, but there are many infants who do not have access to milk for a variety of reasons. There are metabolic disorders, other kinds of illnesses in which mothers are not able to synthesize milk. There's historical traumas and cultural contexts that make it very difficult. There are infants who are raised by wonderful families that don't include a mom. And these families rely in very important ways on formula, artificial breast milk. How do we make a better artificial breast milk that delivers more of the important bioactives in milk to help enhance those infants' development. These are the kinds of things where we can take an evolutionary perspective, apply it to a variety of clinical and, and cultural settings to improve human health. And this is what it means to be thinking evolutionarily to approach medical condition challenges of human infants. Thank you.